Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for your will to invite me and Yula to host me. And uh, it's wonderful to see you all. As usual, before our Dharma talks outside of the Temple of Original Light, I'd like us to recite a mantra before we get started. It's the mantra of the universe in its purity called Om Nam. And uh, let us have seven repetitions of this wonderful mantra together. Om much. When we recited the mantra, our bodies and minds were vibrating together. We were not thinking, or not so much thinking as usual. When you think, your mind, my mind, everybody's mind are separate. When you cut off thinking and you return to this moment, then your mind my mind, everybody's mind become one. When we meditate, we can attain that. And what we attain is called our Buddha nature, our common, true human essence, which originally has no name and no form, no life and no death. It is clear like space, clear like a mirror. And in this mirror, we can perceive truth. The sky is blue, the trees are green, there are cars passing by on the outside. And when it comes to action, we can also perform correct action. When somebody is hungry, we give them food. Somebody is thirsty, we give that person drink. So the core of Zen practice is substance. And with the help of this substance, we can perceive the world as we are and other human beings and ourselves as we truly are. And then we can do the right thing. The right thing without being dualistic or doctrinal or depending on any system or scriptures. What really got me to Zen was not some religious affiliation or cultural attraction. Besides the person of my teacher and the way he taught, the four principles of Zen are really primary for me. And wherever I see the operation of these four principles, then I really feel home. I really feel that we have the seeds of the Dharma flourishing. And the first of these is not depending on the scriptures. You should imagine a thousand years after Shakyamuni Buddha, when everybody, Buddhist, was so well versed in the sutras. And suddenly, Bodhidharma comes to China and he puts the mind seal of the Buddha Shakyamuni's transmission line onto Chinese soil. And one of the principles that he actually codifies is this, do not depend on the scriptures. After centuries of learning, understanding, being eloquent about the Buddha's teaching, why does he say that? The second is directly pointing to human mind. 
Over the centuries, there were so many expedient means, systems, symbols, assets, that they got between you and your practice. They were used as intermediaries, as expedient means. And then did away with all that. And less is more in this case, because you can directly approach your true nature. When we ask, what are you? We directly point to that, to our original mind. In the previous 1,000 years, there were many concepts and ideas about enlightenment. Maybe if you can work miracles, you are an enlightened person. Maybe if you live a very long life, you are an enlightened person. Maybe if your eyes are shining bright with some otherworldly air around you, you are enlightened. And it turns out that these features, also those included in the Diamond Sutra as the 32 distinguishing marks of the Buddha, they have no relevance to that. If you attain your true nature, your true self, you go beyond life and death, then you are enlightened. And the fourth is about transmitting this. It's transmission from mind to mind. By then, about the 6th century AD, Buddhism became so established, especially many ceremonies were developed, and it became very formal. But none of these ceremonies have any effect if there was no mind-to-mind -mind connection between teacher and student, or the individual and the group. So these four principles, if you see them anywhere in operation, that's where something live happens. That's where the Dharma flourishes. That's where you can really go beyond illusions and come back to reality as we are. Then we realize what our job is on this earth, why we live our lives, why we come back if we come back. Many times Zen Master Sung San was asked about the meaning of life. And he said, originally, no meaning, no reason. And after you're born, you have no choice but to go through life and then leave, depart. But if you attain your true self, then big meaning, big reason, and big choice all appear. And this is not some empty promise. When you see how we live our lives and what it is that sees through your eyes and hears with your ears, fills with your heart, thinks with your mind, you can see cause and effect. You can see your direction. And if you use your clear mirror, you can change all that. Many of us believe that there's something in us that is immutable. We can't change that. We are subject to that. We have some destiny. Many people in the West use the word karma in the sense of destiny. So instead of cause and effect and the dynamic approach to life, we believe we are controlled by some external forces, whether heavenly or earthly, that we are always subject to the same things that we are afraid of. And when you practice meditation, you can let go of all these ideas, all these fears, these illusions, and come back to this point, to this moment, right here and right now. When you hear this sound, there is no thinking. In this moment of no thinking, there is no you or me or us. Everything comes back to zero. And from there you can see how your mind builds up everything, how your mind makes this universe for you, for us, for everyone. If you want to really understand the essence how it works. Now look at the Avatamsaka Sutra. And the most important part of that is that if you want to understand the nature of this universe, then perceive it as created by mind alone. Now what is that mind? I ask you. If you say you know it, it's a mistake. If you say you don't know it, 
also a mistake. What can you say? Come to the interview room tomorrow. We'll find out. Okay. <laughs> this introductory can go on for a long time, and I don't want to take your time from asking any, any questions that you may have. I am very new at this, and I have tried several different Zen meditation practices, counting my breath or um, saying a uh, loving kindness mantra, several different things. And um, I'm just wondering which method of meditation you use the most that you find the most beneficial for your practice. Let me tell you a story about two farmers in Montana. You know, the prairie, the water is very scarce and it's very highly praised as a resource. So the young farmer gets a couple of thousand of acres of land and the old farmer is watching from the neighborhood. And before long, the young farmer pays a visit to the old farmer and says, Jim, I'm at a loss. You have a wonderful harvest here. I barely find any water, though I drilled several wells. And Jim says, well, how deep did you drill? He says, well, some wells 60 feet, some wells 80 feet, 50, various locations. So how many wells did you drill? Well, about five, six. I have good news and bad news, says the old farmer. Which one do you want first? Good news first. Now the good news is, there is water all around here, underneath. So what's the bad news? It's at 110 feet. So first, we are going to a spiritual shopping mall, and we make our picks. And we want some nirvana tabs, some slices of the Guru's teaching, some historical, you know, works. We shop. That's okay. That's how you get your assets. And then you probably go around several groups, try several versions of meditation. And before long, something, someone kind of catches your eye. Maybe later also catches your heart. And there will be a teacher you trust, a teaching you begin to believe, and a sangha where you feel home. You feel included. And treasure that. And do that for at least 10 years. Then you get something. Okay. You're welcome. More questions? Hi. Hello. Hello. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for coming. Yeah. I wondered if you ever have the experience of feeling many uh, dark emotions come at you. Days, a day when perhaps you wake up and even after you have done your meditation, you feel this negative hopelessness come to you. And if, because that happens to me. And what I do is I say, come on, just give it to me. Give me all you got, because it doesn't matter. You must have been a wrestler in your previous life. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, I've experienced fear, but then I've also recognized that it doesn't exist. How did you? How did I recognize it didn't exist? Yeah. Well, I talked to Pema Chodron about it. She's a great teacher. And she looked me in the eye and she said, sometimes we are always, we are always bodhicittas. We are always Buddhas. Some days we are good Buddhas and some days we are bad Buddhas. And in that moment, it became very clear to me. So then why ask this question from me? Because I'm trying to wrestle with it. You love that. I don't. I don't want to, I don't want to wrestle. 
Then why do you say, come on, is this all you've got? <laughs> I don't know. I think I'm angry that they keep coming. Anger so is I one want, of the worst so possible I want, emotion. I want to bully them. You want to bully them? I'm just trying to get them to go away. But if you're angry and if you want to bully them, they will keep coming. I know. The Dhammapada is one of the best teachings ever recorded. You know, it's very succinct, four-liners. And in that, the Buddha says, if this exists, that also exists. If this ceases to exist, that also ceases to exist. As long as you want to bully them, you want to win, you say, come on, they will keep coming because you are the magnet. Whether a positive magnet, you feel good about it, or a negative magnet, you feel terrible about it. No matter how you set up the polarities, the other part, the missing part, will be coming. So the moment you let go of this anger and this wish to bully, they will go away. We say, you cannot hit empty space. The moment you have a surface, that can be hit. You have an eye that can suffer. So don't make eye. Don't make these emotions, because they will attract more. Yes. And that's why we meditate. When we focus on our Tantian or Tanjon in Korean, then we focus at a point where there is no mind, no differentiation, no entropy, no multiplication. Because when your energy moves up, it becomes emotion one, emotion two, speech, thoughts, sensations, okay? And that's how we live our lives. The fuel for that is chi, or in Sanskrit, prana. When it goes lower than your tantian, you make kids. That's the physical differentiation. That's how life works on this earth. But if you really want, want to come back to the mind, which is before anger, before bullying, before negative emotions, then come back to the Tantian. That means you come back to the moment and to this mind, which is clear like space, clear like a mirror. And that has nothing in it, okay. but reflects everything. Okay. Okay? Then you're free. Okay. Okay? Yes. Good. Thank you. Once in a while, like for a second or two or a half a second, I'm really not. So I want to know how I can work with that nanosecond and make it one second, three seconds, 10 seconds before I bring my crap into it and like lose the moment. What do you see now? Now? Yeah. You. No, you is something you think. Your thinking makes you. Do you see why OU displayed on a board here or here? No, that's what your mind makes. What do you see? I don't know. I mean, when I don't see, I know I, there's nothing. When you don't see your thinking, you can think there's nothing. You can think there's something. But with our eyes, we see forms and colors. So if you say, if you say your clothes are gray, that's something your eyes see. Or your kasa is brown. Or the Buddha behind you is golden. That's something your eyes can see. And what I'm teaching you and every one of us is how to distinguish our thinking from our visual perception, to keep the channels clean. You know, when we drive our cars, it's very natural that we stop at the red and go on green. And you naturally dismiss your thoughts, even dismiss your mobile calls, so that you could pay attention to the moment, to the action, not to crash your car. But when you're in a meditation room, we are deprived of external stimuli for good reasons. So that nothing would push all these tendencies back. And then you can see that there's not a single moment when your mind is inactive. And then you can come back to 
the mind which is before thinking and take the energy out of here and here and here so that you would have less thoughts, no speech, and even less emotions during that time. That means you wipe the mirror clean. You know? Because we are intelligent. And sometimes our intelligence makes us attached to things and phenomena that we like or identify with. And those identifications are spots on the mirror. That's when you can't see clearly. That's when your crap comes in, as you termed it. The word for meditation in Japanese means heating up the heart in English. So imagine a surface which is very cold and you drop a water on it and becomes a layer of ice on it right away. That's when the mind is very cold and identifies with everything that you like or dislike. The identification means very low energy level. So when you heat up the heart and you meditate, you start to reflect. And the surface, you know, as the water bounces on it, immediately makes a puff of steam. And that steam just goes away. And if the surface becomes really, really hot, then the radiation becomes so intense that this drop of water doesn't even reach the surface. It becomes steam right away. So if you reflect and your mind is steady, it becomes very, very strong and clear. Then you perceive the shocks, you perceive the crises, but you're not immobilized by them. You're not frozen by them. That means your reflection stops you from any dualistic reaction, stops you from being identified with that kind of karma. And that's one of the primary uses of meditation, why we do that. It brings you the mind quality that can help you deal with all these things that we are dealing with as human beings. With good and bad, gain and loss, etc., etc. So, please don't check your mind. Don't count the nanoseconds. Come back to the moment each and every time that you feel digressed or distracted. And come back to what you hear, what you see and what you are doing right now. Connect it to your breath. Connect it to your body sensation. Then your mind doesn't wander and stops being distracted. And then you do a great service for yourself and others. Because instead of being the problems, we can become the solutions. Big difference. Do you have any advice or suggestions on how to develop and maintain more discipline? Why do you need more discipline? I think that my life has changed a lot over the last few years and I would have thought of myself as a very disciplined person at another time in my life, but I'm finding it difficult to find the form or the structure that I used to have that would help me find discipline. What do I need discipline for? <laughs> Lots of things. I, you know, keep my practice up um, just to keep moving forward. Do you know the word circumambulation? Mm. That's what you've done. You circumambulated the problem. I'm not prying into your secrets. I'm pointing out how your mind works. Right. If you need discipline, you think, then there's something unfinished in your life, something undone, a problem that you have not solved. And usually it's human relationships. Mm -hmm. Instead of wanting an external form, I could talk to you about discipline forever what kind of monastic discipline we can have, what kind of lay practicing discipline you can have, what kind of discipline you can have in the armed forces, okay? There is no external solution to what you're asking. I'm encouraging you to ask the right question. And if you ask the right question, then your mind gets into a very focused and collected mode. That's the internal discipline that we need. External discipline is very temporary and usually um, after a while we just cast it off like a snake casts off the skin. Ask the right question and be serious inside. Then your whole world, your whole environment will change because your mind has changed. 
But if you do not ask the right question, if you circumambulate the problem, then no matter how much external discipline you may have, you will not solve the problem. You will not answer the question. Why? Because you never asked it in the first place. When we study meditation and people ask about meditation methods, they want to know how to sit, how to breathe, how to keep their minds. And I always say that if you really want to learn meditation, you have to make a vow to yourself that you dare to see what's going on inside. That you have the courage to be honest with yourself. And then meditation techniques will work. It will work for you, not against you. But when you just want to use it as some form or a discipline that you can later display that I've done this, then it doesn't go inside. It doesn't go deep. It remains on the surface. And then it adds to the problem rather than take the problem away. What's your question inside? Not my business, your business. Okay? Dare to ask that. Spend hours asking the right question, distilling it, probing it. And don't worry. You want to be happy. You want to get rid of suffering. You want to be organized. We all have that urge because human beings are so, so predictable what we want and what we do not want, then this internal discipline will help you. Okay? Yes. Okay, I have a, pra a question about my practice. My practice entails playing around in my head, pretty much. It's like a, pr a playground. It's like when I start meditating, it's fun because I choose one mantra and I, and I can and I become absorbed in it, and I can feel it's like a car going from second to third uh, gear. I can actually feel, I believe, my brain waves changing. I love that stuff. <laughs> I do too. You love science. I know you do. Not only that, I love good cars. So oh, you do? Yeah. Okay. Of course. <laughs> science? That's boring. Gear shifts up to six. That's our ground. Talk to me. Okay. What's, what's wrong with that? Go ahead. Okay. Well, so what's wrong with that? Because I do, um, in going, you know, in playing around in my head, you know, okay, let's try this one now. You know, let's try a body scan. Okay, let's try this mantra. Um, and they, they all work. They all get me to the, um, the lower gear you know, the more cruising gear, yeah. one might say. So I just want to know if that is um, anti, uh, what am, is it, if it's, um, if that's unproductive not to be, as somebody said just a few minutes ago, disciplined. And this is within the practice, not, you know, on the outside, but within the practice, not being disciplined, just All right. making it a playground. A playground is the most creative place on earth. So it is productive, but too productive. And that means you don't produce anything. Play with the mind as long as you want. No problem. But please understand that's, that has nothing to do with Zen meditation or meditation of any kind. You play in your internal mental playground and it's very good. Children who play on playgrounds a lot, they become very strong, very social, etc., etc. So your mind get, can get various skills. But these skills have nothing to do with attaining your true nature. So we usually say, think out of the box. But in Zen, as long as you're thinking, you are in the box. So the moment you want to get out of there, you have to stop playing. You have to stop thinking. And I know it's difficult. But we're not selling anything easy here. But you also don't make it more difficult than it actually is. So what you should really ask, what is this? Ask the question, and the question begins to still your mind without any force, without any external boundaries. So what is it that sees with my eyes, hears with my ears, feels with my body, thinks with my mind? What is that? 
And if you ask that question, then suddenly you get insight. Insight into the nature of this game. Why you keep your mind so busy? What is it that you want? And what is it that you're hiding from? So you will see. Keep asking the question and first of all, you will be tremendously bothered. I, I promise you that. But then the bothersome part will stop when you see the benefits. That you're no longer subject to your functionally autonomous psychological karma. You can stop that. You can make one step back, you can take the key out, the car stops running. Uh, play as long as you want and then go back to the player and stop the game. And you can do that very well with the question. Also you can do bows, and bows are not worship. Bows are cleaning up your, your body and mind together. If you're aware of the microcosmic orbit, it's a Taoist concept. That's how our chi operates in the upper body. The microcosmic orbit begins to flow the, to the right direction when you bow. That's something they don't teach you in the Orient. You have to figure it out. Because you do the right thing with body and mind, body becomes flexible, mind becomes clear and flexible and stronger. Can you just clarify the bowing thing? Because I've gone to several sendos where we began with three bows. Mm -hmm. What type of a practice with bowing? There has to be more bowing, lots of bowing, intensity, De how to Depending use on how, met, how many bows you do, uh, you will feel the effect. The basic three bows is for the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Right. You pay your respects to the teacher's lineage, not just to one, from Shakyamuni to the current guy, you know, next door, and to the Dharma, the teaching, this is pretty obvious, and the Sangha, the community where you practice. But if you do like 108 bows, traditionally this meant that you bow to the 108 Buddhas and Bodhisattvas that relieve the 108 kinds of major suffering that the Buddha himself identified. 108 bows is really the kind of uh, soup of the day for any Mahayana Buddhist. It's, it's really a good start. And then it, you really let go of any ideas and you're just at the moment watching yourself as you bow and you breathe. You go down, you breathe out, you come up, you breathe in. Not too fast, not too slow, not too ceremoniously. And also this is not gymnastics. So you find the middle way, and protect your knees. It's important. <laughs> just even if you have a very good body, if you don't protect your knees for, for 20 years, they wear out. It has a lot of benefits. A lot of benefits. And it's not worship. It's really putting yourself to the right place in the universe. That means your own person, your, your own ego goes down and your Buddha nature, the Buddha himself or herself for that matter, goes above that. And that's a very important position. It's not being humiliated. It's just being deferential. Okay. I have a kind of personal question in a way. I'm, I I'm, would like to you to talk a little bit about your temple and what the significance of it is mm -hmm. and um, just your process of getting to it. In 2003, I made the decision not to go back to Asia. I really wanted to, but I didn't see the use. And I, until then, we had the Zen Center, which was like an apartment in Budapest, downtown. And I really didn't see myself living there too many years, you know, longer. So we started to look for land in 2003, September, using a very kind of detailed map of the Pilish Mountains, north of Budapest. I was looking for good spots using the principles of Asian geomancy, Feng Shui, if you know that word. And uh, Feng is actually, or Pung in Korean, that's the wind, it's the shape of the mountain. And Shui, or Su, uh, is water, it's the shape of the valley. So the layout of mountain and water, where the lakes are, where the water streams are, where the peaks and the ridges are, they are pretty good guides uh, to choosing the right spot for a temple. 
We had been looking for a year before we found it. And in 2004, September, suddenly, we came out of a place where we found something unsuitable. And on the way out, something really got me. I stopped the car. I go into the center of this space where we have now. And it, there was just this joy beyond description. It was not just the mountain layout. It was, it was something else. But that moment keeps me going ever since. And uh, I just knew that this had to be it. And in 2005, we started to buy land. In 2006, uh, we started to build. In 2010, we opened the first traditional Zen hall. And uh, after some legal setbacks that we cleared up in seven years, we started to build another building this year. And we finished it this year. That's the office building, also in a traditional form. Because we pay our respects to our tradition in many ways. And one is to demonstrate the excellence of this mind by putting it into the correct architectural form. Uh, next year, we want to build the big Zen hall because we grew out this, the current one. You'll see some of the drawings if you're interested in this uh, binder. Because uh, the Zen hall is the heart of the temple, the Zen temple. If it's a ceremony temple, then the Buddha hall is the heart of it. But meditation is our bread, our daily bread, that we want to give and consume at the same time. This temple is serving everyone. We have many nations coming. And the moment somebody non-Hungarian enters our halls, everything turns bilingual. All the major staff speaks English. At this note, I would like to cordially invite you to Hungary, to the Temple of Original Light, uh, to practice together. Don't think it's too far. It's a 10-hour flight to Europe. That's it. We, we really try to help people become clear. We say, whether you are religious or not, it doesn't matter for, no, for us, whether you believe in God or not, or believe in gods like Hindus or not. It's immaterial. The difference is how you came in with what kind of consciousness and how you leave this temple, the difference between these two is our, our work. That you leave with a more aware mind, with a more awakened heart, with more compassion and more wisdom. That's our job. And I'm happy to report that the system given us by Zen Master Sung San as Kongan practice, meditation practice, it's, it's working. It's working very well. We just have to apply ourselves. We have to make some effort. I think this kind of cooperation helps us clear up the karma that I got to see as European group karma, which is super heavy. It's riddled with unresolved problems and it's festered with wounds of false identities and, and illusions that we still subscribe to as, as a continent of more than 300, 300 million people. It was Europe and its culture that produced two world wars in the last 100 years. The ideologies, the identities, the remnants of imperial behavior, all of it happened in Europe. We exported it to other continents. And make no mistake, in a different shape, such problems can happen again, can occur from angles that we have not seen before unless we diffuse the source. And the source is our own minds. If our minds are clear, we don't make these terrible things happen. But if our, if our minds are not clear, we say we had no choice. When your mind is smaller than the problem, you say you had no choice. When your mind is bigger than your problem, you see the alternatives. Then you do have a choice. So I would like us to have a choice. And that's why the temple is there. I'd like to have everyone the opportunity to wake up and become a better person and create a better world where the term better means less suffering and more enlightenment. Because it's so abundantly clear that this earth is neither good nor bad. It's not a prison colony for, for human beings, neither it is paradise. But the earth as an environment is the true reflection of our minds, a true reflection of who we are. We are good people, the earth is good to us. 
We are bad people. The earth is bad to us. We decide. There's no excuse for our own anger, greed and ignorance. This planet doesn't care. We should. And in a couple of decades, we'll see what happens. But one thing you should, you should know, we'll, we will never stop building, practicing and teaching. This is the tripod of our lives there. Practicing, teaching and taking care of the temple, whether it's new construction or just harvesting vegetables. And inviting people like you to make this into a wonderful network of like-minded humans. You were just um, <clears throat> taught, you mentioned system, your system, and then you just men mentioned practice. Um, Kongan practice, practice teaching, and meditation and technique. Then sustaining yes. The, is that the system you were talking about? Well, in short, yes. The system is something we can understand, it's the backbone, it's the very methodology that Sung San Sim gave us. Like, I give you an example. We have many Kongans to work with, that's training your intuition. Think of your, your intuition as an organ that you haven't used for decades. Intuition is not quick thinking or just emotional intelligence. Intuition is the direct function of your true nature without the bondage of your karma, without being determined by your habits. You use thoughts, but you don't use your thinking patterns. You use emotions, but you don't use your emotional attachments. That's where intuition begins to kick in. Now there's a way to build that up. And there are many reasons why I feel grateful to Sung San Zen Master. But one is that he gave us a system whereby we solve easier kongans at first, then more difficult, then higher and higher and higher, and then in a couple of years, you really get the hang of it. And this is wonderful. And I bow to him and all the ancestry lineage in gratitude for that. Because before him, there was of course kongan practice for centuries in China, Korea and Japan, primarily. But the system was not there. So you got a Kongan and you went up to the mountains and you practiced for 10 years and maybe you woke up and maybe not. Some people got discouraged, they dropped it and then they left the mountain because they thought themselves as an unenlightened person. Without this kind of approach, the systematic gradual approach, Kongans could not really be used as a means to attain clarity, relationship and function correctly in this world. Meditation method is something that is not systematic in the Orient. As a monk, you don't really get it first. They throw you into the temple as an apprentice, later, later on as a novice, and after five, six years you may sit in a Zen hall to meditate. And during those years you may not even receive one sentence of meditation instructions. But when you get to the Zen hall, then everybody more experienced can teach you. Not before. There are many reasons for that. They had to test you first. Do you have stamina? Do you have willpower? Can you really be patient? Etc. It's not like you enter a Zen though and give me the package. <laughs> no. The whole package. The simple and clear meditation system that we use here geared for you guys also lay people, not just to monastics, is the second important part of uh, the Zen tradition. The third one is actually Sangha life, something that you cannot define with systems, but the Sangha also has rules, how we live together, how we relate to each other. It's just as important as the teaching itself or methods of meditation. Because if the Sangha cannot hold itself together, then the first two cannot be sustained because only we can do that as a community. There's no one else outside of the human mind that can perceive and understand Dharma on this earth as of this moment. So it's important that we have each other, that we have a teacher, that we have something we can practice and share with each other. So these are the three very important areas that I consider as the the foundations of Oriental tradition in the West. There are many other aspects, of course, but these three I consider pivotal. Thank you. Sometimes when I sit, I uh, fall asleep. 
You and too? I'm, yeah, everyone okay. does. <laughs> but then I'm, I'm not alone with that. No, no. Great. Okay. Do you snore? I do. No. I didn't get to that. In the zendo. Because, but when you're sitting vertical, you snore? Well, I don't know if I'm vertical because I'm falling asleep. <laughs> sort of vertical. <laughs> but you don't lie down, huh? No, no, no. Okay. So let's suppose you're vertical and you're like a rock and you can snore. How do you do that? That's, it, it, it's really difficult. Well, that's not my question. <laughs> <laughs> my question is, I, I, I suspect or I think I've experienced this lovely little place just before sleep. It's lovely, but you can't stay there. No, but I think it's as close as I ever get to, like, experiencing no mind. I, I, I don't know, it's, it's a kind of a cheat, you know, because I couldn't get there if I wasn't falling asleep. But I just have a suspicion that that is a sweet spot. It's a very nice place. I'm curious if you have any thoughts. I'm sure you've, ex if you've fallen asleep, you've, pro you've experienced it too. But what, is that a hint of where it would okay. be nice to be if, if one sit, weren't falling asleep. Of course, if you talk to someone who sits retreats regularly, everybody has that experience or they just want to hide it if they say they don't. Sure. So when your thinking stops, there is a sweet spot. But the way your thinking stops was actually getting drowsy and sleepy. Right. So you can't keep that mind. That's why I said you right. cannot stay there. I know. You overshoot and you fall. Right. And then you fall asleep. Yeah. So how about doing this without feeling drowsy or sleepy? And yeah. you use a different technique. Sure. And that is coming back to your tantien very, very slowly, patiently. And when you do that, then the technique to let go of this thinking is not falling asleep. Hmm. Just stop the thoughts by taking out the energy. Don't blow out the candle. Okay? Because when we fall asleep, our awareness is gone. That's why we can sleep. If you are observant, then you can observe the last couple of seconds and that's where the sweet spot appears. But you can't stay there. This clear mind, clear like space, clear like mirror, mm -hmm. is attainable. Sung San Sarim used to say, getting enlightenment very easy, keeping enlightenment very difficult. <laughs> That's why we practice. Could you just say something about the mudra and yeah. the fact where your hands are placed? Because it's very close to the Dantian. It is, is, is on is the that, Dantian. Is that the best place to keep one's, to hold one's hands in the mudra? to correspond to yeah unless you drive or cook <laughs> or operate your computer <laughs> but when you meditate please right. keep your hands in your, this beautiful mahamudra you know resting on your thighs tucked in you know to touch your lower belly and then naturally it focuses on your tantian and it and it should be like in the shape of a bird's nest mm -hmm. and then it it's really focusing the energy of your whole upper body to that location and remember that's the point of no thinking. That's the point of really connecting to the universe with undifferentiated mind or no mind. Okay? That's why we do that. Thank you. I struggle with language sometimes. Um, you too? Me mm -hmm. too. You know, getting... Uh, Is the words, right? <laughs> well... Or the sentences? It's the, it's the not going into thinking with the... I mean, and then I love language too. I'm, I'm, I'm so into language, but I'm just, so I'm now asking about English is good. Intuition. I mean, I love English, isn't it? And it's, it's a great language. English is okay, yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> what's your question? Uh, intuition and language and, you know, I mean, I, I, the whole thing of the, the, the connecting. Um, if you think I'm about so language, you can't talk mm -hmm. because your meta layers are stronger than your primary process. Mm -hmm. Primary process is so instinctive, especially when you speak your native tongue, that you don't think about the words you choose. Mm -hmm. It's spontaneous. Yeah. So we have eight levels of consciousness. Eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body as touch, conceptual mind, distinctive mind, memory. That's eight. 
So all these eight function like the hardware and the software of our human being. The hardware is the body, the software is the mind. Your true nature is not part of the eight. It's reflecting all the eight. That's the operator. So when your language works, then from your storehouse consciousness, your memory, you spontaneously evoke all those labels that you use in English for this is a stick, for this is a bell, for this is a light, etc. You don't think about it because these self-referencing objects, we say self-referencing because we learned them. But this thing doesn't say I'm a bell. We say it. So these are compiled very quickly into sentences. The music is added as intonation. We distinguish between the words as good words and bad words. Also our sixth consciousness analyzes that. Did I say it right? Then the five physical senses, they interface with the world. And we use language as hot. Or, oh, very soft, wonderful. So linguistic function is very, very intuitive. It's very much describing who we are as human beings. I think nature is our best teacher. Nature speaks to us in a non-human language, luckily. Otherwise, it would just be another voice we should argue with. But if you perceive really your environment, that's also a language without the cognitive background and the labelings of a human being. So interestingly enough, if you're a smart person and you fish for conclusions and smart ideas, you're like a good fisherman who sits in his boat, goes out to sea, and he casts his net and he catches clever fish. But if you are interested in the complete experience of the sea, you realize that the net will never catch the sea. It catches only fish. So if the fisherman changes his mind and is not satisfied with just clever ideas, wonderful conclusions, sharp questions with language, and wants to attain the sea, then he has to put down the net and jump and swim. Now, fishermen never do that. So, normal human beings who are attached to thinking and language and believe it as the only cognitive reality that we have, they almost never shut up. They almost never fall silent. They are physically afraid of a kind of stimulus-free environment. They are disturbed by nothing happening. Things like that. You really realize what is language when you are silent and how, how your mind works when you deprive yourself of these external stimuli, like in a zendo. So use language, but also attain the user, okay? We talked the other night about technique, and I would like to ask you to expand on that again about just sitting or using the technique. Meditation technique has three very important parts. One is the physical, the way you sit, and you keep your eyes, and hands. And that has to be kind of compact and vertical and collected. Next is the breath. Breath connects the body and the mind. We watch the breath for one reason and one reason only, awareness of this moment. That's all. Even so, the mind starts to play on its own playground and we have to have these very kind techniques that, kiddo, come back to mama, okay? So how the mind comes back to this moment and stops playing, that's the mental technique. And we have three of them in our own tradition. We use three major techniques. One is perceiving the sound and the space. And the equation is very simple. You perceive space and sound you're clear. You are here. You are not digressing. If you lose this moment with the space and the sound, then your karma took you to Disneyland or Wonderland or the enchanted castle, but you're somewhere else. When you notice that, just come back to the breath, come back to the sounds, come back to the space. Why do I say sound and not silence? 
Because if you meditate long enough, you realize there's never complete silence. Even if you go into a cave, I tried it. You meditate and your own heartbeat starts to throb in your ears after 10-15 minutes. So strong, you can't believe that. As long as you are alive, there's vibration because you are alive. You can perceive that. Second technique is the great question. I've mentioned that tonight. What is this? So the original teaching says whether you are sitting, standing, walking, lying down, talking, silent, awake, or in a dream, constantly, without interruption, what is this? So what is it that hears with your ears, sees with your eyes, feels with your heart, thinks with your mind? What is that? And what is that which says I, thereby opening the greatest chance to become aware and conscious and also a pitfall to be egotistical and self-centered. If we understand this I, it's not enough. If we attain this I, we can help all beings. And the third technique is the mantra. The mantra is like a firewall. It protects your own mind against its own harmful influence, like reactive mind reactive, dualistic emotions and thoughts. In that sense, from this angle, you can be your worst enemy and you can be your best friend, depending on the reactions and perceptions that you have. And your perceptions are not reactions and your reactions are not correct perceptions. That's why mantra practice is so necessary to separate the noise from the signal the worries and the concerns and the fears from legitimate preventions, okay? So these are the three major techniques. You're welcome to try each one of them. But remember the farmer in Montana. Give yourself enough time. In this sense, it's anywhere between three weeks to three months that every day you do one of them and you don't mix it with the other two. Do not. Otherwise, it gets kind of wishy-washy. Eight things that you put out on the stick, and then you said the original Buddha nature is reflect is not one of those eight? Nope, it's and not. It's, I'm just, I've just wanted to hear more about that. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so I'll say it again. Okay. Actually, you touched upon my favorite structure in Mahayana Buddhism, because it's really good for Western mind to have a systematic view and understand something. And at the same time, the same teaching gives you an option to go beyond that. Mm -hmm. All right? So... We have the hardware, this body, okay, with the six major channels of eyes, seeing, and ears, nose, tongue, body as touch, and mind as conceptual thinking, which is dependent on your brain. You have no brain, you have no conceptual thoughts. The seventh is distinctive, distinguishing mind. That's where you separate uh, dirty and clean good and bad. And our first distinction is I and the rest of the world. It's our major conscious distinction. We can go through that, you know, as the child develops, you see, that's mommy, that's the rest of the world. We want mommy and we don't want anything else. That's how the child's mind works. And then it goes on and on and on with more and more subtle distinctions. If the seventh consciousness is hyper-functional, we become judgmental because we distinguish and we judge at the same time. If it's under the normal function, we cannot really tell right from wrong, dirty from clean, friend and foe, because it's not working correctly. So the seventh consciousness is actually the duality maker. And we cannot live without dualities on this earth, but if we believe in them as absolute, we have a problem. That's where judgment of mind develops. Let's have our daily distinctions and heaven forbid us from any judgments. Okay? And the eighth consciousness is your big hard drive, your storehouse, where all your memories are. And what's interesting is that you have about 5% of your personality as conscious, that you can fathom, that you can see. And 95% of your memories are beneath 
the level of consciousness. We call that subconscious. And the way they organize themselves, Jung, Carl Gustav used to call them archetypes. So we have several boxes of memory, like the image of a man in your mind as a mate, possibly husband or partner. The image of a mother, image of a father. Because we had many, many, many lifetimes where we had, of course, mothers and fathers and spouses. And we had identification with these memories and these identifications became the archetypes. And what's interesting is that the seventh consciousness actually controls them very much, controls the memory, what you can and want to remember, so that the other six are not disturbed, so that you could think freely, that you would not go back to the past too much, also not to the future too much. It's regulated by the seventh. And the eighth, the hard drive, actually has everything that you have ever identified with, positively or negatively. If you make good, you ID with it positively. You make bad, you ID with it negatively. So hopes and fears, positive and negative identities, they are all in your subconscious, whether you like it or not. And when you meditate, you switch off the sixth. You don't make any concepts. You switch off the seventh. You don't make any dis distinctions or judgments. And you let the eighth function by itself. That's how it gets cleaned out. We store so much of our traumas and so much of our past you know, karma in the eighth that it has to be cleaned out if you want your memory to work correctly. Sometimes we remember things that has nothing to do with this moment. And what we need in this moment just wouldn't come. So when your mind is clear, we have what we call intuitive memory that is really dependent on this situation, on this kind of relationship and the function that we have together. You remember what you need, and you don't remember what you don't need. It's very fluid. It goes without thinking. That's when your sixth, seventh, and eighth, they function correctly. When they separate, then we feel a little bit off. We feel sometimes a little bit out of place. We feel alienated, because we are not really connected to the environment if the seventh or the eighth takes over. And if they peel off and they separate, then people call, can go crazy. You can see that. So the health of the hardware and the software together is up to the quality of the operator, how we operate these two together. So naturally, if you do meditation in the right way, you're more harmonious. You attain this oneness. You feel integrated. And this integrated personality is the desired result. Okay? And with that transcendental view, transcendental practice, it's not possible. So only the operator can really perceive the hardware and the software. And in this case, the operator can fix it. And uh, at this point, I really want to thank you for your wonderful attention and hope to uh, see you tomorrow and also next week for more Dharma events so that we could practice together, wake up and save all beings from suffering. Thank you very much.